Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei played host to a legendary vampire queen. Part 2. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. What the hell? Issei Haidu stood outside the entrance to a subway station. He just stepped in something wet, making him cringe and lift his foot to inspect it. Is this blood? It was truly nighttime now, with not even a crescent moon in the sky left to shed only illumination was a flickering street lamp nearby, which seemed liable to go out at any moment. But even that was enough, because he couldn't have missed it if he tried. Blood. Blood stained the ground, smearing its way down into the subway station. As if someone had completely bled out on the ground and then dragged themselves away in the seconds they had left. Or someone or something had done it for them. Issei glanced around, feeling a little self-conscious of his position. The fact that he was alone now rang out loudly in his mind, and suddenly Tsubasa's words from earlier in the day echoed back to him. It's a vampire, she'd said. Surely not, right? There's no way. Vampires don't exist. But the fact of the matter was this, there was blood on the ground, and somebody was obviously very hurt. And that was more than enough for Issei. Stealing himself, he stepped onto the staircase leading down into the subway system. He tried his best to avoid the splotches of blood as he descended, but the smell made his senses spin, and the sheer amount made his heart pound like mad. Vampire or not, somebody was in a bad way down there. Unfortunately, he didn't trust his luck enough to help the person responsible had come and gone. Resolving himself to run away quickly if he found someone dangerous, he continued on. It was chilly, enough so that every labored puff of breath came out as sickly white fog. He descended flight after flight of stairs, following the straight blood trail down the mall. The first room he came upon was the main hub of the subway station, empty at this time of night, with not a soul besides Issei there to see the macabre spectacle. As he continued, the blood trail veered sharply to his right. He turned to look, and there on the wall was a massive amount of gore like a human had exploded. Issei swallowed hard and walked on, sure that whoever had bled that much had to be dead. But as sure as he was, he wasn't quite sure enough someone could be dying, and he couldn't abide by that thought. Issei's pace quickened. He went down staircases and through hallways, over catwalks and under barriers he passed an employee's only sign no less than twice, and still the blood let on. Something's wrong, he whispered to himself. Something's so fucking wrong. Someone who'd bled enough for ten people couldn't possibly be alive. But what if they were? He came upon a set of five downward escalators. He couldn't see what was at the bottom, but he could tell the trail continued down so down he went. His heart hammered in his chest as he slowly descended. Surely this was close to the bottom. He'd been searching for quite a while now. As the escalator brought him to its end, he once more began to follow the trail. It got much thicker now, and as he looked forward, he realized why. Oh shit. The blood trail ended abruptly. Right on top of the end, lay a corpse. It had once been a beautiful woman, but every single one of her limbs had been unceremoniously cut off, leaving her in a massive pool of her own blood. Her right arm was a stump, sliced just above the elbow, her left was cut at the shoulder with nothing remaining, and both legs were cut off just at the knee. The tattered red and black dress she wore did nothing to hide her wounds. Issei struggled not to scream or vomit at the horrific sight, but despite himself, he continued forward. Now. His heart jumped into his throat when the corpse spoke. She was alive. Despite the catastrophic damage, she was alive. I will let thee save me. Issei's mind went into overdrive as she raised her head to face him. Golden hair and eyes. Pointed ears. An intensity unlike anything he'd ever seen. Even without her limbs, she was, without contest, the most beautiful woman he had ever laid his eyes on. Can ye hear me? I'm saying I will allow thee to save me. You're alive. Ignoring her, Issei stumbled forward, numb at the shock of what he was seeing. He slipped on the blood and fell to his knees beside her. Are you okay? I'll call an ambulance. An ambulance? Don't do something so useless. She looked him dead in the eyes, with a piercing gaze that turned his blood to ice. Thus give me thy blood, instead. His heart stopped. What did she just say? His mind slipped back to earlier that day. It's a vampire, Tsubasa had told him. They say she's as beautiful as a goddess, with golden hair and eyes that'll stop your heart cold. Issei nearly laughed. She was right. Tsubasa had been right. My name is Kishad Acerola or Iron Herdenderblade, the iron-blooded hot-blooded cold-blooded vampire. I will devour thy flesh to make it my own, so hurry and offer me thy neck. The way she said it really did make it sound like an honor, so much so that he almost nodded along. Issei's mouth was unbelievably dry, and he found it difficult to talk. A vampire? Then you shouldn't you be immortal. I have lost too much blood. I can no longer regenerate or shape shift. At this rate, I will die here, she candidly declared. A worthless human like thyself should consider it an honor to become my sustenance. Oh yeah, consider me honored, he said, swallowing hard. His humor landed flat and failed to calm him. So, you need blood. From me? How much, exactly? 
He was barely able to get the words out such was the overwhelming terror he'd found himself in. My entire body should serve as a sufficient stopgap. Oh, okay, just my whole body. Issei spoke like he was honestly considering it, but when the full impact of her words hit him, he nearly choked. In a single instant, it all crashed down over him the reality of the situation. This was a dying vampire. He would be eaten, consumed, devoured whole just to extend her life. Issei Haidu realized he was going to die. What's the matter? Struggling to remain calm, Issei looked back towards where he'd come from, as if weighing his options. The escalators were only running down, but if he tried he could make it up them. Noticing his pause, Kishot's voice became forceful and demanding, completely unlike her previously calm, matter-of-fact demeanor. Give me thy blood hurry. Why art thou dozing off, ye dolt? I. Hurry up, you damnable human. This shot shouting mounted in intensity, and that pushed Issei over the edge. I should be able to escape Issei whispered shakily, as if assuring himself. I can probably get away. After a moment of silence, he took a step backwards. And another. And another. Issei slowly backed away from the fallen vampire, willing himself to flee with every step. This shot's eyes went wide as she realized exactly what he was doing. Wait. She yelled in disbelief. Surely ye jest. Their face contorted in fear. Thou aren't thou aren't going to save me? Issei had almost made it to the escalators when she began to scream in terror. No, no, no. She wailed on and on, screaming and sobbing and flailing her bloody stump arm this way and that. Blood splattered everywhere and tears ran freely down her face. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. On his way out, Issei slipped in blood and ended up sitting on his rear and facing her. Save me. Save me, please. I beg of thee. In her frantic screeching, she managed to flail herself into an upright position, only to fall pathetically onto her face. She used her stump to drag herself towards where Issei sat mortified, unable to move. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She dragged herself forward as she shrieked. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. An unnatural calm befell her face as she apologized, and tears of pure red blood began to fall from her golden eyes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That broken whisper was thundering in his ears when Issei lost it. With every ounce of courage he could muster, he picked himself off the ground and sprinted towards the escalators. Kishot's cries echoed behind him, but he didn't stop running. He ran and ran, adrenaline fueling his overclocked limbs until finally he came to a breathless halt near where he'd originally entered the subway station. Panting like a dog, he sat down on an empty bench and tried in vain to calm himself down. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. He could still hear her down there. Falling like a child. The vampire's death rattle. The woman was a vampire, yes, but. She was so gorgeous. Issei had never seen a being so beautiful in his entire life. Even in her pitiful attempts to beg for her life, she was every bit as immaculate as the Virgin Mary. A vampire, he whispered to himself, as if trying out the word. She really was going to die down there. Even a vampire, a being truly immortal could die. If he left her there and let her be she would cease to exist. In the morning, the subway's cleaning crew would find a beautiful corpse. Issei swallowed hard. If he left her there wouldn't it be the same as condemning her to death? And wouldn't that be the same as killing her? She's gonna die, Issei said out loud, like he was confirming it. She's really gonna die down there all alone. Golden hair and eyes. Pointed ears. An intensity unlike anything he'd ever seen. And one more thing that he'd failed to truly appreciate while in her presence a bus that quite possibly surpassed any mortal woman. It dawned on him, then. If he let her die that bust would die out with her. Those magnificent boobs, unparalleled by any human alive, would cease to be. Oh my god. This a, it all became clear. Don't give up, idiot. This shot Acerola or Iron Heardenderblade stared up in blatant disbelief at the human boy who'd come charging back down the stairs like a madman. What? You can't die. If you die, something glorious will disappear from this world. I can't let that happen. Issei spoke with an awful lot of conviction for someone with such a sad look on his face. But of course he did. He could talk about boobs all he wanted, but when it came down to it, he was just giving her his life so she could live on. Regardless of whatever excuses he made for himself. Then it's alright. She asked, deathly quiet and hesitant, as if afraid she'd scare him away again. She was deadly calm, and bloody tears still graced her impeccable face, but still, still she looked like the terrified one. Of course not, Dumbus. I wanna live too. But go ahead. Drink your fill. It's all yours. With that, Issei Haidu offered his neck to Kishot and put his head on her chest. While he indulged himself, he closed his eyes and spoke one last time. I promise I'll do better in the next life I'll really get my harem, next time. They weren't much, as last words go, but they'd have to do. This shot looked down at him, not understanding at all. Was he really just giving her his life? But she wouldn't argue. Thank you, she said, softly. And then, with no more fuss, she bit into his neck. 
I have never, in my entire life, been saved by another being. Not as Princess Rola. Not as a fake god. And certainly not as Kishad Asarola or Ian Heerdenderblade. I have been offered many lives and taken many more, but never have I had one given up willingly solely for the sake of my own. When the boy ran away, I did not blame him. Was he not following his instincts? Did not his basest, most human impulses, tell him flee, lest ye die here? I had resigned myself to perish. After making such an awful spectacle of myself and driving him away like I have so many others, I accepted the fact I was going to die in such a dreary place. And then I heard it. A roar, not unlike that of a dragon. I looked and behold he was coming back. I could hardly believe my eyes. My first thought was that he was coming back to finish the job. He was on the side of humanity, after all. Wouldn't he be within bounds to slay me then, on behalf of his species? Even encouraged to do so, I'd wager. But then he surprised me. This boy, this idiot human. The say hi do. He said something to me that I'll never forget, in this life or the next. There's so much worth living for. At the time, I only stared blankly. Little did I know what impact his bold declaration would have on me. Don't give up, idiot. It was unusual to be told off like that by a human or by anyone, but I didn't argue. After all, I was at his mercy. He held me up off the ground by the waist, where I was at eye level with him, and he spoke to me like I was his equal. What? I didn't understand. Why would he come back down here? You can't die. If you die, something glorious will disappear from this world. I can't let that happen. Something glorious. Could he be talking about me? But then, what could he do to save me? If not his blood, then, oh. He was talking about his blood. Then it's alright. I was so uncertain, so positive that I was being played the fool that I could only ask a meager question. Surely, surely this boy wasn't going to offer me his neck. Me, the apex predator that had plagued his people for centuries. It was inconceivable. Of course not, Dumbus. I want to live too. But go ahead. Drink your fill. It's all yours. He laid his head upon my breast, offering me his neck. Offering me his life. He had chosen to die for me. Not to die in honor of me, not to die for my name, not to die for the idea of a beautiful princess he chose to die for me. To give up his own existence that mine may continue. And I thought only knights in storybooks could be so bold. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. Thank you. I thanked him, and then I did what he said. I drank it all. Every last drop. And as he lay bloodless and dead in my embrace, I began to think. I have lived 598 years upon this earth, and in that time this is the only one to have saved me. In the many centuries since that dreaded witch turned my life into a nightmare, I have had thousands of lives sacrificed to me, and not a single time have I saved one in return. Never been saved. Never saved a life. Not anymore. I buried any ideas I had of eating his body. This boy my savior. He would not die by my hand. Late evening, April 30th. So what were we gonna talk about, again? Your new duties as a devil, of course. Oh? Great. Issei sat on a couch in the orc club room, or rather, he sat atop the lap of a certain vampiress who was sitting on the couch. Rhea sat at her desk, and Akeno stood behind her. Kaneko and Kiba were on the couch opposite Shinobu and Issei. But, before we get into that, I'd like to know a couple more things. The fallen angel who attacked you last night, he mentioned you having a sacred gear. Right. Yeah, that's right. He said that's why Raynor killed me, Issei explained. He noticed Shinobu's grip got significantly tighter around him at the mention of his death, but he didn't think much of it. And did Raynor herself say anything about it? Uh, no. She thanked me for the stupid scrunchie I bought her and then ripped me a new one. Through their mental link, Issei could feel Shinobu's barely constrained anger. She was not over the incident, and even if he could make jokes about it, she was nowhere near that point. Ah, sorry to bring it up, but I'm trying to put together whether or not their suspicions had merit. You see, it's entirely possible that they simply mistook your odd relationship with Miss Shinobu for the signs of a sacred gear, but it's also possible you do possess something like that. Sacred gears are super rare. Most of the people I know who have one are historical figures, Akeno said, jumping in. So if you do have one, you'll be kind of a big deal. Shinobu briefly wondered just how much more of a big deal they could be, seeing as they were already two of the most powerful beings on the planet, but she supposed the Redeed was the only one who truly bore witness to that fact. Well, uh, I hate to disappoint, but I don't think I have anything like that. It's entirely normal to not realize you have one until you awaken it. I didn't know for a long time, myself. Fiba had such a bright smile on his stupid face that Issei wanted to puke, but what the pretty boy was saying made him a little confused. Wait, you have one too. That sucks, I thought they were rare, Issei grumbled, his excitement squashed. He didn't really want anything the crown prince of Kuo had. Oh, they are. But mine wasn't anything big enough to have me targeted by assassins, I assure you. It's called sword birth and lets me create any type of sword. Fiba accentuated his sentence by forming a dagger in his hands as a bit of a show of power. 
Oh shit, that's actually kind of awesome. Issei got way more excited at that, forgetting his animosity towards Kiba for a moment. He seemingly also forgot that he could do the same thing, lost in his awe for the neat trick. Alright Issei, could you put up your left arm? Ria's asked, standing up. She walked around to the front of her desk and sat on top of it, waiting for Issei to comply. Okay, sure, but I'm really bad at catch Issei put up his left arm as instructed, not really sure what she was going to do. Ria's held up a finger, speaking like a teacher. Close your eyes and focus on the part of your body you feel is the strongest, then focus hard on that strength. Wait so we're doing this now. There's a lot of pressure. It'll get easier if you focus, Ria's chastised in a stern voice. Right, focus. Issei exclaimed, shutting his eyes. Focus, 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 focus. Issei focused as hard as he could on the strongest part of his body. It was, of course, his left hand. According to Ria's, he should be able to feel something inside his strongest body part, which is probably why she had him hold it up. After a moment of intense focus with nothing happening, he opened his eyes just a bit and realized he was able to see right under Ria's skirt. His blood-red eyes sharpened, absorbing as much of the side as they could. This was so different from the first time he'd gotten a panty shot. Tsubasa's had been tame, but Ria's was wearing a see-through thong. Cease. A sharp flick to the head reminded him whose lap he was in. Ouch, what the hell. If ye focus any harder, ye shall blast thy master to smithereens with thine evil eye. Oh, shit. Yeah, that wouldn't be very good would it? Issei rubbed his head, embarrassed, while Ria's gave him an odd look. Evil eye. She asked, not knowing what that was. Uh, yeah. We can sort of blow stuff up. With our eyes. Evilly. Evil eye. Haha Issei laughed awkwardly, having given yet another subpar explanation. I see, Ria said, only a tad bit uncomfortable with the fact that her new servant could apparently blow her apart with a thought, and he couldn't even control it properly. And he might have a sacred gear. Ria sighed. Sorry to disappoint, but are you sure it's not just Shinobu? I mean I'm not that cool. The fallen angel saw you as threat enough to want to kill you, and even with your low level of vampirism, you were mostly indetectable. I seriously doubt there was a mistake. The more Ria's thought about it, the less she suspected the fallen simply caught onto Shinobu's presence. According to what she and Issei had said, they were both barely above the level of being human, not enough to catch the attention of anyone who wasn't standing nearby. And certainly not enough to warrant an assassination. Yeah, well, she did kill me, and now I'm here. How does that work? His voice accusatory, Issei stood as he spoke. Like I said before, twas my decision. Sit and spare her thy rage. Shinobu pulled Issei back onto her lap, much to his annoyance. Moving on, Ria's asked a question. Do you remember getting one of these? She picked up a face-down slip of paper off her desk and flipped it around. It was a plain flyer, with magic symbols drawn in the middle and have your wish granted. Printed in bold letters. Akinda, yeah. I think someone handed me a flyer like that one while I was on that date. That's right. Just after your life ended, Miss Shinobu summoned me through this flyer. Summoned? Issei didn't really understand. She got summoned through a piece of paper. And so, that day, you were revived and reborn as an honored member of the house of Ria's Gremory, daughter of the great and powerful devil, the Marquis of Gremory. Ria's devilish wings popped out of her back, adding emphasis to her bold showboating. Wait a minute, hadn't she done this exact routine a day ago? And that makes you my servant, she added with a smile. The rest of the peerage stood up, their own wings sprouting. Isn't this so exciting? You're really one of us now, Akeno said cheerily. Issei's own wings popped out without his control, coming from the small of his back and spreading out from underneath Shinobu's arms. So much for pretending to be a human, I guess, Issei mumbled to himself. He'd had a long talk about devils with Ria's the previous day, but it was only really just settling in on him. Ria's Gremory. I would speak with thee, Shinobu suddenly announced in a gravely serious voice. There was a palpable shift in the tone of conversation. Ria's unconsciously swallowed. It was like the entire atmosphere of the room had changed. Um, you guys can go get started on your work for the night. I'll stay here and get Issei going. Okay. Ria's dismissed the other members of the peerage, who said simple farewells to Issei and Shinobu before departing. Yes. Ria's asked when they were all gone, hoping she hadn't provoked a super predator. No one in the room save for her and Issei had seen this woman's power, and Ria's was right to be afraid. Shinobu laid her head on top of Issei's, pulling him tighter into her embrace. Remember only this. Before this boy is thy servant, he is mine. He and I will outlive all of thee, so if he wants to pretend to play slave for a century or two I will not object. I acknowledge thee purely because I owe thee for saving his life. But, make no mistake, Shinobu's eyes sharpened and the air in the room turned frigid. All of the candles went out, and the only light in the room was from the moon shining in through a window and illuminating her otherworldly features. The air itself seemed to grow heavy, weighing down on Rhea's chest like it was trying to keep her from breathing. 
On was Shinobu Ashino, relatively passive vassal of Issei Haidu. In her place was Kishad Asarola or Iron Heardenderblade, apex predator and legendary vampire. Any insult to him is an insult to me. Any order to him is not an order to me. The ones he gives me I will carry out without question, even if it is to destroy thy entire species, if ye try to order me, I shall tear out thy tongue. Have I made myself clear? She didn't really need an answer. All the candles in the room relit themselves, and the atmosphere returned to how it had been before. Rias visibly exhaled, and a bead of sweat rolled down her forehead. Hey, don't be a dick, Issei said, and reached up and over his shoulder to flick his shot on the nose. He turned to Rias, who looked like all the blood had drained from her face. Sorry about that, she gets kinda touchy. Right, to Rhea's credit, she did a stellar job of compassing herself. Well here's how it works, she went on, the slight hint of fear and hesitation leaving her voice as she continued. We devils grant power to humans for a price we both agree on, and then we seal the deal with a pact. It used to be that people would draw magic circles to summon us, but nowadays we do house calls and personal deliveries. Just like that, she was back in her club president persona. She must seriously be something else, to converse that easily with such a deadly being in the room. Shinobu snorted a laugh at what she'd said. A demon that makes house calls. Pathetic. She missed the good old days, when one would summon a demon with a circle of blood. So, for your first job as a new devil, I was planning on having you deliver these, Rias collected a stack of papers from inside a drawer in her desk, the same kind as the one she'd shown Issei moments ago. Alright, I can do that, Issei was quick to affirm, wanting to assert that he didn't share the same viewpoint as Shinobu. I'm glad to hear it. Rias retrieved a white cloth bag from underneath her desk, setting it on top. Issei left Shinobu's lap and started to shove all the papers in the bag. Normally we'd have a familiar do it, but I think it'll benefit you to learn what all goes into this job. Plus, Rias got right by his ear, whispering, if you do a good job, you could even have some servants of your own someday. Now that got Issei's attention. Servants. Like, people that had to follow his orders. No matter what. He was practically foaming at the mouth. I'm into that. I want some servants. Like I said, that all depends on your efforts. Let's say my efforts are awesome. Does that mean my servants will have to do everything I tell them to? That's right. And they're mine, so I can do anything I want with them. MHMM. You see where I'm going with this, right it's gonna be sexy time. From her place on the couch, Shinobu laughed. Her master was as one-track as ever, even in the presence of this girl he barely knew. Before I get you started on delivering those, though, I'd like to ask about your diet. We talked about it for a moment yesterday, if you recall. Yeah, I remember. What about it? Issei shrugged, not thinking much about it. He continued to shovel pamphlets into the sack she'd given him, his mind clearly still on servants. Well, I think it's pretty important. Are you going to need bodies to eat? I can accommodate that, but it'll take some time. Whoa whoa whoa, stop. Are you serious Issei exclaimed, shocked. You'll just get me some bodies. Hmm? Yes, I will. I don't want you to starve, Rhea said, a little confused. Okay, let me think for a second, Issei facipumed, realizing there was a pretty big disconnect in what he knew and what Rhea's assumed. By all means, Rhea's replied. So, uh, normally vampires like me and Shinobu can get by on one meal a month, but like I've never eaten anybody. I don't really want to eat anyone, either. Then, how ah, uh, I see. You mentioned you can lower your level of vampirism, is that it? Issei was impressed she'd caught on. Yeah. If I keep it low, I can eat normal food, and Shinobu can drink my blood, but we won't be very strong. Earlier this morning we actually tried having it at around the level of a half-vampire, so I could walk under the sun, but I dunno how that affects being hungry. You said you can't just drink blood at your current level, right? Yeah. We spread vampirism at this level with a single bite, so we have to eat the whole body or they'll come back to life. Then, if you were a half-vampire, could you get by on just blood like a damper does? There was silence for a solid few moments. I, uh? Issei didn't really know what to say. He looked back to Shinobu, who herself had a curious expression. Is worth finding out, I suppose. Ne'er have I been a half-vampire, the vampire said, shrugging. As aloof as she seemed, there was a hint of excitement in her eyes, like she was eager to know if Rhea's proposed solution would work. Well, it's something to keep in mind. For now, let's just worry about getting you started on some devil work, okay? I'll give you a map, and you take those flyers to the spots on it. Alright. I'm all over it. Issei pumped his fist, excited. Great. Here's your map, Rhea's handed him a Magic 8 Ball-esque device with a screen on one side. Let me show you how it works. Hey, so, um, would you go off on Rhea's like that? Issei and Shinobu were walking around residential Kuo streets, working on posting flyers in different points around the city. They'd walked almost the entire way so far in silence, until Issei popped that question. I was merely setting expectations. You told her you'd rip her tongue out. Now she knows to expect it. 
Issei sighed, exasperated. Well, don't do it again, please. She did save my life, and all. Plus, this devil racket doesn't seem too bad. I don't want to piss her off. If he insist. Thanks. There was a pause while Issei stapled a flyer to a street lamp, then they continued. So, have you met any devils before? I. Mephistopheles. Bless you. Wasn't a sneeze, Millard. Mephistopheles is an ancient devil, the one who tricked Faust into handing over his soul in exchange for quaint worldly pleasures. Faust. Issei vaguely knew the name, but he couldn't remember from where. As thy school taught thee nothing. The legend of Faust and Mephistopheles is quite a well-known one. Yeah, school nowadays doesn't really deal with legends. Pathetic. I shall educate thee in their stead, then. Oh boy. But someone like Shinobu, who had lived nearly 600 years but also had an awful memory, learning anything could be very hit or miss. Keep thy grievances to thyself. Call it the price of being ignorant, Shinobu said with a smirk. One long, drawn-out fairy tale history lesson later, we're back Issei groaned, closing the orc door behind him and Shinobu. Ria's was nowhere to be seen, Akeno was messing with something in a cabinet near the entrance, and Kaneko was sitting by herself on one of the couches eating a blue popsicle. There was something strange, though in the corner of the room directly to the right of Ria's desk, there was a curtain drawn over an outcropping in the wall, and the silhouette of a person from the waist up could be seen behind it. Running water echoed throughout the club room, and Issei's mind short-circuited. Is someone in a shower? He asked, literally not believing his eyes. Yep, Kaneko replied. Akeno laughed. Issei didn't even know what to think. What kind of club room has a shower? More than that, who showers when their club members are around? There was a bit of an awkward silence then, until a few moments later when the shower abruptly stopped and Ria stepped out of the curtain clad in only a towel. Welcome back, she said innocently, as if she wasn't stark naked. Chmagluritherswerf, Issei intelligently replied as his vampiric healing worked to stop his brain from dripping out of his nose. Shinobu pursed her lips, obviously not impressed. What kind of harlot let herself be seen in such a state by someone she'd only just become acquainted with? Was the notion of being ladylike gone entirely from this era? Not to mention, who did this brat think she was, to flaunt such an obviously inferior body in front of her master? I trust you finished your deliveries. Did anything interesting happen? Ria's asked, drying her hair with another towel handed to her by Akeno. Just a history lesson, Issei grumbled, trying to ignore Shinobu's grin. And yeah, I finished them. Well, all's well that ends well, excellent work. I only have one more job for you tonight. Kaneko is double booked with two summon requests. Take one and get some practice. Issei glanced at Kaneko, who bowed her head to him. That'd be super rad, she said. Uh, sure, no problem. Issei bowed shortly in response, before turning back to Ria's with a glint in his eyes. So does this mean I'm legit? Am I making a pact? The Keno stood at the center of an elaborate magic circle, glowing bright red with runes rotating around the middle. Her hair and clothes seemed to move as if being blown by wind, despite being in the middle of the orc club room. Whoa, what the hell? Issei was stunned. He'd seen magic twice before, once with Shinobu, though calling it magic may be stretching a bit, and once with Akeno, but neither time had been nearly so flashy. Naturally, Shinobu wasn't impressed. We call this a transportation circle. It'll take you to where your client is waiting. Hold out your left hand for me, if you would. Ria's. Now clothed, stood beside Issei a couple of feet from the magic circle. Shinobu was mere centimeters behind him, her concept of personal space practically non-existent. Dibba, who'd just come back from his own pact, was now standing beside Kaneko in front of the couches. Uh, sure. Is it gonna hurt? In response, she simply touched his left palm, and an intricate crimson magic circle appeared on it. This is called a seal. It marks and verifies you as a member of the Grimmery House. When you get to the client's location, don't panic and just do everything I told you. Think you can handle it? Hell yeah, let's do it. Issei pumped his fist, showing his resolve. Very cute. Alright, stand in the circle. Make me proud, Ria's cooed. Awesome, I do this, and I'm one step closer to having my harem. Issei could hardly contain his excitement as he walked forwards, standing in the epicenter of the transportation circle. Shinobu stayed where she was, a smug grin on her face. She had a distinct expression of I know something you don't know, and it was about to become painfully obvious why. Red motes of light began to gather on Issei, coalescing around him until he shone so bright it was hard to look at, and then they all disappeared at once, while the circle poofed away without so much as a flash. Issei was left standing in the middle of the room with no magic circle, wondering what had happened. The fuck? Oopsie, Akeno sang with an apologetic grin, her spell having utterly failed. Dibba snorted a laugh, but did his best to quickly cover it up. Ria's fascipumed, but she had a smile underneath. No, it's okay, she said, looking at Issei. What gives? What's okay? Looks like you can't make the jump, but there's another way. 
This sucks balls, what kind of vampire rides a stupid bike? Haka, tis certainly a first. Thou should have known their magic wouldn't work on me, methinks. How the hell am I supposed to know that? Their teleportation works on the principle of demonic energy, no. Well, suffice to say thou hast none. Being a vampire counts for jack shit, huh? Vampires don't have any energy. Our strength is in our bodies. Thy level as a mere reincarnated devil is too meager to have any sort of stored strength, either. I suspect in the future ye may find it easier to use such magics, but for the moment thou art simply too weak. Bisay, atop a red bicycle, pedaled at a swift pace towards the house of his first client. Since his teleportation failed, Riaz had given the bike to him as an alternative, along with a map, so he didn't lose his way. Shinobu sat in the bike's forward basket, still at her full power, but choosing to take the form of a little girl in a white and pink dress, with a matching straw sunhead. This was the same form she was in when Issei was killed, but this time she could shift into her true state with a simple thought, and was merely in it for the convenience of fitting beside her master on the bike. And because, sometimes, she liked being small. Do weak, huh? Maybe I'll figure out how to use that secret gear or whatever, and then we'll see who's too weak. About that. Have ye chosen what to do about your current power level? Thou cannot stay a full vampire forever. Well you don't really want me to go back, do you? Thou noticed. Yeah. Shinobu sighed before continuing. Tis true. I'd prefer thee to stay, at the very least, a half-vampire. Tis a dangerous life thou hast found thyself thrust into, and watching thee die again is not a pain I could bear. But would I have to eat anybody? I know not. Thy health would certainly wane, were ye to sustain thyself on only human food, but the redeed devil made a very interesting point earlier. About drinking blood as a half-vampire? Aye. Twould be most useful. Thou could stay as a half-vampire, and ye would be functionally immortal without having to devour a soul. That does sound pretty great. Aye, save there's no way to test it. What do you mean? Hast thou not spared it a thought, Millard? Say ye, as a half-vampire, were to bite thy master as a trial. What are the two things that could happen? Uh, well it either does nothing, or oh. I get it now. Shit, that is kind of a big deal, huh? MMM. Twold resurrect thy master as our kin, which would hardly be ideal. One fledgling vampire is more than enough for me, Kaka. So what should I do? I know not. Were ye to truly have some incredible latent ability, I would feel more comfortable remaining at a lower level of vampirism, but as it stands, I simply cannot watch ye die again. Twold drive me utterly insane. Shinobu wasn't joking, or exaggerating. To have the only thing that had made her long life bearable, suddenly ripped away the amount of sheer agony she'd felt before his resurrection is entirely unimaginable to a normal human. Well, for what it's worth I'll try not to die again. I promise. Tis worth not. Thou art as headstrong as ye are reckless. Yeah, well, you're as blunt as you are mean. Aka, I shan't deny it. It was at this point Issei had reached the location Riaz had given him. He pulled his bike to the side of the road and inspected the area it was a residential neighborhood without any outstanding features to distinguish it from any other. The house he was supposed to be at was on the second floor of an outdoor apartment complex, addressed to Amorosawa. What are you gonna do? Issei asked Shinobu as he walked up the stairs to the client's door. Watch thee fail from a comfortable distance. Best of luck, Shinobu said with a grin before sinking into his shadow. Damn cocky vampire, Issei grumbled, purposefully stepping on where she'd been before continuing to the door of his first ever client. He approached the door and then went to knock, but stopped. What the hell was he supposed to say? What did a devil normally say when they got summoned? Would it even be applicable to a door dashing demon? This is so stupid he mumbled, then knocked. Mr. Morisawa. Devil's knocking at your door. Open up. The door cracked open a bit, revealing a skinny and sunken bespectacled face on the other side. Would I want? Hey, how's it going Issei started to say, before being quickly ignored while Morisawa closed the door. Get out of here, the man said, dismissing Issei entirely. No come back, I wasn't kidding. You summoned the devil and I'm here to hook you up. Since when does a demon knock on the front door? Uh, first time for everything, screw you, I'm not an idiot. I know how this works. Kaneko comes through the flyer every time, she's the one I asked for. Get off my porch. Look dude, I dunno what happened. All I know is I couldn't do it, and then they said I had to get here and put me on a fucking bike. A beak. Issei, now desperate, sank to his knees. After a moment of definitely not crying, the door opened once more. Okay, fine, Morisawa said, mostly out of pity. A couple minutes later, Issei was seated in front of Morisawa's table, a cup of green tea in front of him. The entire room was something out of an otaku's handbook, with manga and DVD and I'm lining the shelves of several bookcases, along with figures and posters everywhere. That said, it was both orderly and neat, for an Otakus's room. Issei was sufficiently impressed. HMPH, alright, if you're gonna be the stand and you've gotta prove yourself. What cool devil tricks can you do? 
Morisawa asked, sitting down in his swiveling desk chair and looking down at Issei. Well, uh, not much yet. But I can do some cool vampire tricks. Issei said, defaulting to what he already knew. If you do anything stupid, it'll be thy master who pays Shinobu Warren from inside his shadow. Vampire? Seriously? You're a real vampire? Morisawa asked, his interest piqued. Damn right. Check these bad boys out, Issei gloated before showing off his inch-long fangs. Oh wow, you're totally right. Now that you mention it, your eyes are pretty red all right then, what can you do? But turn my hands into swords. Turn into mist. Turn into well, pretty much whatever I want, really. Super strength, super speed, regeneration, all the normal stuff, I guess. Issei listed off superpowers like they were the most normal thing in the world. All right, those are all pretty cool, but what can you do for me? Morisawa asked, not very impressed. Oh, I can make you something, I guess. Oh? Make me something. Yeah. I can create stuff. What are the limits? Gotta be something simple, cuz I'm not that good at it yet. Simple alright, how about a set of replica dragon balls? Morisawa exclaimed, both disbelieving and excited. Ah, is that it seven dragon balls, coming up? Making no attempt to actually create them himself, Issei reached down to his shadow, which extended a tiny hand, and gave him a lacquered cherry wood box with a shiny pearl inlay. What the hell is that? Morisawa exclaimed, having seen the hand come up out of his shadow. Don't worry about it, it's my vampire's assistant. Anyway, here's your dragon balls. Issei said, handing the ornate box to Morisawa. The nerd took it gingerly, holding it like it was a precious relic. He slowly opened the lid, and his jaw nearly dropped off his head. They're beautiful. He shouted, stunned beyond belief. Is this Amber? Holy shit kid, you're the real deal. Ha. Make a pact with me, and there's more where that came from. Deal. Easy PC, lemon squeezy, Issei said with a smug grin, walking alongside his bike. Thou surely art a new level of pathetic, to be bragging about forming a pact when it was I who created the objects that man desired. Shinobu sat once more in the basket, legs crossed. And for your help. Three donuts. HMPH. Dost thou truly think my aid is so cheap as to be bought by meager sweet treats? Yes. Thou would be correct. Three donuts it shall be. I knew you'd see it my way. At first, Issei thought he was dreaming. Above him was dark dreary gray, a storm cloud. Around and below him, washed out gray walls contrasted against black and white checkered floors, the room around him struck the very picture of dreamlike. Then it occurred to him that dreaming was strange to begin with, since he was supposed to be dead. After a wholly justified bit of panic had come and gone, Issei scratched his head and looked around himself with a much clearer gaze. Where the hell he murmured to himself, looking around and trying to make sense of where in the world he was. There were no windows or light sources in the room, save for the one huge skylight in the roof, currently being beset by the soft pitter-patter of light rain. Issei guessed it was around midday, given how even though a cloud covered the sky it wasn't completely dark outside. Straining his eyes to make sense of the gloom around him, he came to the conclusion that he appeared to be in a school, surrounded by chairs and desks in various states of disrepair. A classroom? He put his hand to his head, trying to remember just what in the world had happened to make him wake up in a classroom, but the last thing that came to mind was finding that woman in the subway, which had to be a dream, right? After all, vampires didn't really exist, did they? But then where was he? What had happened? Looking at the watch on his left hand, he checked the time and date around 10 in the morning, March 28th. The 28th. But that couldn't be right, could it? Two days later. It was then that our poor Issei noticed the other elephant in the room or rather, on his arm. His right hand was on the torso of a sleeping little girl, no older than 10, in a rather precarious position. His eyes went wide. A flurry of thoughts shot through his mind, most prevalent being who the hell is this little girl? Ah uh, hey. Wake up, Issei said, shaking the little girl in the safest place he could think of, her upper arm. She was wearing a strange pink dress and was very thin and pale, to the point of almost looking malnourished. Her hair was golden blonde and sat in a messy bob cut. She grumbled in apparent displeasure, then turned over, not waking up in the slightest. Five more minutes, she mumbled, much to Issei's frustration. What the hell? Forget that, wake up. Issei shook her much harder this time, prompting a mean glare from the little girl, before she scooted away and resumed sleeping. Come on kid, where are your parents? Now that got her attention. Parents? She asked, cracking one eye. Uh, yeah. And why are you sleeping in some classroom? Are you lost? Hurt. Issei began asking an avalanche of questions, worry written all over his face. But that impromptu interrogation, the little girl finally sat up. She inspected Issei's face, looking for some hint of a joker humor. There was none. Dost thou truly think I'm a little girl? She spoke in an incredibly outdated way, not unlike something you'd hear in a fairy tale. It confused Issei a bit, but not so much that he dismissed worrying about her. Uh, yeah. Are you homeless or something? 
Far be it from Issa Haidu to speak with tact, even to a kid. Homeless. Hmm, well, I suppose that's correct, in a manner of speaking, the little girl, after a moment of consideration, nodded her head. Seriously? Do you live in this school? For the moment, I. Are you alone? That depends entirely on you. There was a moment of awkward silence as Issa parsed that line. What a weird thing to say. All right. What's your name, kiddo? Issei asked, moving past her odd words and trying to find common ground with this weirdly well-spoken child. Kiddo. She repeated, as if she didn't understand the word. Child. Issei offered instead, wondering if maybe Japanese wasn't her first language or if she'd learned it from someone who didn't really know it that well. Child the little girl repeated, this time nodding very slightly. This shot Acerola or Ian Heerdenderblade is many things. She is generally not a prankster. Generally. Rola, she said, trying not to smirk, I am called Rola. How far would her new servant go for a child he didn't even know, she wondered. Would he be her knight now, too? Well, it's nice to meet you, Rola, Issei smiled brightly and stuck his hand out for a fist bump. I'm Issei Haidu. Rola warily eyed his fist, unsure of what to do. She was, being several centuries old, understandably behind on current customs. Choosing instead to disregard his action and use her own manners, she quickly curtsied. Well met, she said. Issei, not really understanding this kid at all, pulled his hand back. Oh uh, well, do you need help? But what, pray tell? Rola cocked her head in question. Anything. I mean, it's not really normal for a little girl to live in a school, is it? Is it not? No. I see. Where should I be, then? Daycare. Foster home. Orphanage. Issei rattled off some suggestions, not really knowing what to do with the situation. There was nothing he wanted more than to scream what the hell happened to me, where am I? But at the moment his priority was making sure this random little girl was safe. Um, no. I think, unless I can find another suitable dwelling, this shall remain my home for now. A dwelling. Like, a house. The little girl shrugged. If that is what's available. Well Issei's first thought was come to my house, we'll get you fixed up. But he couldn't really just come out and say that could he? He considered his options for mere moments. There wasn't really anything else to do, was there? Why don't I take you to my house? Then you can figure out what to do, Issei offered, scratching his head. He briefly considered taking her to a police station, but that might be getting a little ahead of himself, and his parents would know what to do better than he might. As tempting as that sounds, Twol be much safer to stay here. This shot was impressed. Not only had he shoved his own questions aside to ask Rola if she was alright and safe, he had also offered to take her home. She wouldn't go, of course, because that would endanger them both, as well as his home. But, it was a nice sentiment. Alright, then. Well then, can you show me the exit? I don't really know how I got here, but my parents are probably getting pretty worried about me by now Issei got up, heading towards the door. No. The little girl shouted, worry suddenly covering her face. Issei recoiled, not expecting the outburst. I mean tis raining. Thou can't go outside in this, can ye? Rola laughed nervously, realizing her charade was falling apart. She did want to see how far Issei would go, but she also couldn't let him go outside. I think I'll be alright, it's just drizzling Issei was hesitant to speak, the girl's sudden worry had given him a bad feeling about the whole situation. Once more he headed towards the door, only to have his path blocked by Rola. I cannot allow thee to leave. She declared, spreading her little arms out to bar his exit. What? Why the hell not? Issei asked, dumbfounded. Thee shall perish. She shouted, her face every bit as serious as such a grave sentence demanded. There was a brief pause as Issei calculated the truth behind her words, she certainly didn't look very credible, and between her cheeks being cutely puffed up and standing on the tips of her toes, this pouty child seemed a lot more like just a pouty child than someone genuinely trying to warn him. I think I'll take my chances, Issei said in a weirded out tone, deftly moving around her. He got a couple feet before she was in front of him again, this time literally pushing on his abdomen to try and get him to stop moving. How cannot. I will just no longer if ye exit this building, Twill put thee in mortal peril. Okay, you're officially starting to freak me out, Issei said as he gently pushed the little girl's oddly weak limbs away from him, walking past her. He left through the classroom's only door and completely disregarded any sort of direction, simply following the path that looked like it might lead to an exit. Rola followed behind Issei as he quickly walked away, but was unable to quite keep up the height and stride difference was fairly substantial, being that she was about 40 centimeters shorter than him. Cease at once, I demanded. She yelled from behind him, panting in exertion. Geez, this kid is persistent, Issei mumbled to himself, ignoring her pursuit. After he turned plenty of corners and went down a couple staircases, he finally came to an exit. Outside, the rain was starting to clear, and the first beams of bright sunlight began to peek through the clouds. As he got closer to the large double door exit, Kisshot stopped her chase and looked on in abject horror. I beseech thee, don't go outside. 
She called out one last time, but it fell on deaf ears. The little girl seemed downright frantic at this point, but Issei once more ignored her. His head was spinning, and he needed some space and fresh air at the very least. He burst through the doors just as the clouds were going away entirely and basked in the sunlight with a smile on his face. A hysteric scream came from Rola as he turned to look at her, smiling brightly back at the girl while he pondered what her problem was. But then, something felt a little odd. A little flicker between his fingertips, as if a bug had crawled onto him without realizing it. Issei raised his hand to examine the sensation when, to his great surprise it caught fire. He had only time enough for a single panic though to shoot through his head before the pleasant warmth of the sunshine turned into mind-splitting agony. But in less than a second, Issei's whole body erupted into a roaring inferno. That idiot really did it. Kissshot hardly had time to fathom the depth of Issei's stupidity before she, too, had leapt into the sun, flinging herself towards the flailing teenager. She similarly burst into flames, but you couldn't have told she was on fire from her demeanor she didn't scream or even flinch as she went to retrieve her ward. Grabbing Issei by his shirt, Kissshot mustered every ounce of strength her child form could summon and threw him back into the school. She followed closely behind, rolling herself forward and coming to a stop on her rear end in front of him. Issei, gasping, felt himself over. He was just on fire, but he didn't feel burned at all. Art thou satisfied? The tiny voice he'd previously ignored now rang uproariously in his ears. Honestly, what kind of idiot throws himself into the sun? Issei turned his head slowly towards the little girl, sitting down on her bottom with her legs stretched out in front of her. Were we of a lesser breed, ye'd have been immolated instantly. Well, luckily for thee, thou art my kin, so the damage is already gone. Rola had a cocky grin as she held her face in her hands and stared him down, watching him collect himself. Ye seem to have had wax in thy ears before, so listen well. Ye shall never again walk under the light of the sun. For better or for worse, thou art now immortal, so ye shall burn and regenerate, burn and regenerate tis an eternal living hell. Then, in this morbid situation, this little girl had the gall to laugh before she continued. Unexpectedly, she reached towards his head, making a safe flinch, but instead of doing anything else weird, she simply patted his head and ruffled his hair a bit. That is, if ye define an undead vampire as a living thing, she added on, grinning like mad. After a moment of silence, Issei gulped hard, the pieces of the puzzle finally clicking in his mind. Vampire? It seems thou hast figured it out. Then, that woman from the subway, indeed. Twas I, Kissshot Acerola or I and blade. She put heavy emphasis on the role in her name, cheekily grinning as Issei caught on to her prank. As she made her second introduction, she crossed her arms and nodded along, seemingly extremely satisfied with herself. Issei just watched, his brain pretty much short-circuiting. He may address me as Heerdenderblade, she said with a grin. Unfolding her arms and leaning forward, she crossed her hands behind her back and began to circle the poor Issei. It's been more than 400 years since I created a servant and this is but the second time. But, judging how thy healing powers are, it seems I have done well. Servant? Issei repeated, scrunching his face in confusion. That's right. Kissshot excitedly declared, pointing at his face. Therefore, you. This shots was silent for a moment, heavy thought on her features as she narrowed her eyebrows and rubbed her chin. Come to think of it, I seem to have forgotten your name. Issei's jaw nearly dropped off his head. It hadn't even been 20 minutes since he introduced himself. Ah, I recall. Twas it a high onpen. It's actually a say hi do. Ah, I see mine was better, but tis of no consequence. This shot turned around and walked slowly away from him, speaking aloud. Thy previous name has no meaning towards thy new self at all, but if thou art attached to it, I shall allow you to keep it. Allow him to keep it. The say narrowed his eyes, visibly taken aback. Just how much audacity could one person have? Anyway, my servant. This shot turned around, looking him directly in his eyes. Welcome to the world of the night. A few moments later, Issei was following Kissshot through the school, which, upon a thorough inspection, rather than a hasty run, seemed to actually be more luxurious than Kuo Academy, Issei's current school. There were several floors, all of which had gorgeous architecture. Where are we? For real, this time, Issei asked, a little miffed upon realizing Kissshot had been fucking with him the entire time she claimed to be a child. Apparently, tis called a cram school. Though, it's been abandoned for years, which makes it useful for hiding ourselves. Really? Cool. Well then, Kissshot, my next question. Wait. Issei stopped halfway through his sentence as the suddenly angry Loli marched up to him. I thought I told you to call me Heerdenderblade. Seriously? Issei said with a deadpan. That's a total mouthful. Kissshot is easier cuss it's shorter, or is that a no-no? Kissshot looked away, not meeting his gaze. Well for some reason, she turned unusually meek. If thou art fine with it, then I guess tis fine rather, I have no reason to decline. After a moment of awkward silence following her trail off, she spoke again. So? What was thy next question? 
I don't really know how to ask it, so I'm just gonna say it. Am I really a vampire? That goes without saying. Thou wert set alight by the sun mere moments ago, as I recall. There's no need to explain after all that. Thou have become my minion and servant. Ye should feel honored. Wait a damn minute. Issei suddenly shouted, his eyes going wide. Kisshot jumped at the sudden intensity, quickly backpedaling as he began to rapidly approach her. Soon she was unable to back up anymore as Issei walked forward until she was pressed flat against a wall, blocking her escape by putting both his arms on either side of her. His eyes were frantic as he shouted a question. Be honest with me. You're really the woman from the subway, right? What? Of course. Don't be stupid. No. Issei slowly fell to his knees, letting out a cry of anguish so genuine that it would put most Hollywood actors to shame. His shot watched in confusion, not understanding at all what in the world could be causing him such distress. I failed. It was all for nothing. All for nothing. What in the world are you talking about? Something glorious has disappeared from this world. Something glorious. This shot thought back. Weren't those the words he'd used when he was saving her? His exact phrase was if you die, something glorious will disappear from this world. But the meaning was the same, right? Had he not been talking about her? Losing her patience, Kisshot grabbed her servant by the collar of his shirt and shook him. Get a hold of thyself. What has disappeared? Your magnificent boobs. They're gone. There was a moment of terse silence as Kisshot processed what Issei said while he sobbed quietly. My Kisshot looked down at herself it was true. In her current childlike form, she had no chest to speak of. There was a moment of silent contemplation. She truly didn't know how to react. In all her years, Kisshot had never heard anything so absurd. Humming back to her senses, she dropped Issei's collar and watched him slump to the floor, folding himself up into a fetal position like some kind of pouty child. This shot Acerola or Iron Heerdenderblade inhaled slowly, then exhaled. Did ye only save me from my bosom? She suddenly shouted, kicking him in the side with as much force as she could muster. Not just that. He yelled in his own defense. Not just that. She replied, ferocity in her eyes. And it didn't even work. He cried in despair, not even caring about the little girl kicking him in the ribs. Thou art unthinkably absurd. This shot turned around, not facing him. She huffed and crossed her arms, but unbeknownst to him, she smiled. The ancient vampire had to fight not to outright laugh. What a ludicrous idea. In all the years she'd been alive, she'd never seen anyone do something so silly. Even with the facade she put up, it amused her to no end. Exhaling hard, she turned back around with a sly grin on her face. Well, shed not one more tear, oh servant mine. As horrid as that proclamation was, I have good news for thee. Issei hesitantly looked up, not sure what she'd say. Kisshot gestured to herself, drawing his eyes to her childlike body. This body is the best I could do with what little life I had left. Draining thine blood was just enough to stop my death, not to regain my full power. Dost thou recall the state I was in when ye found me? All four limbs cut off, in a ghastly manner. Uh, yeah. Wait, shouldn't those grow back if you're a vampire? Issei asked, wiping his face. I, if I had my full power. But, the ones who wounded me vampire hunters, severed my limbs in such a way that prevented me from regenerating them, thus greatly subtracting from my power as a whole, with each one stolen. The total being all four, well here we are. This shot pinched one of her arms, showing how frail it was. So is that why your boobs are gone? Ah yes, that's why my breasts are gone. Anyway, I shall discuss that matter with thee at a later time. For the moment, we have another matter entirely to deal with. Groaning and dusting himself off, Issei stood up. What is it? He asked, looking down at Kisshot. We must keep our hierarchy clear, servant. The little vampire puffed out her chest and put her hands on her hips, trying in vain to establish a position of dominance. Even if I look like this, I am still a vampire who has lived over 500 years. I am the strongest vampire to ever walk this earth and have been dubbed the king of monsters because of it. She bent forward at the waist, sticking her head out towards him like she was chastising a child. Thou art merely a newborn vampire and as such are in no position to speak to me as an equal. Uh, okay. What's with that vague answer? Do you truly understand all this? Well, I mean, kind of. Then as proof of thine fealty, rub me on the head. Issei deadpanned, but he did it. He stretched a hand out and began to lightly rub her head, silently marveling at how soft her hair was. It was so soft, in fact, that he almost didn't notice himself petting her head for quite a bit too long. After about five solid seconds of just rubbing her head back and forth, he finally pulled back. Thy fealty is accepted, Kisshot said with a satisfied grin. Issei followed Kisshot through the massive school, not really sure where they were going. She walked several steps ahead of him, not really providing any easy opportunities to stop and ask questions. They currently walked along a hotel-esque hallway several stories above what seemed to be a courtyard, with a massive tree growing up from the ground to way above them. 
They were headed to a balcony Kishot mentioned, the little vampire, saying it would be a good place to stop and explain everything. Why why did you turn me into a vampire? It's not like I tried to. Anyone whose blood is sucked by a vampire will become a vampire. That's all there is to it. Ah, lame. Well, even if ye say tis lame, tis very convenient for me. I have something I need to be. Not facing him as she walked ever onward, Issei noticed she didn't have a shadow. Looking down, he saw he didn't either. It gave him a weird feeling, moving his arms around and not seeing a shadow under them. But, the crazy new muscle mass he had all over his body was a pretty awesome trade, he figured. He tried to do a normal jump earlier and had sent himself literally through the roof. As I said, this is as much as I was able to regenerate with only thy blood. Right now I am far from my full power. So, from here on, ye must act on my behalf. Uh, so what am I supposed to do? This shot stopped several steps in front of him, staring at the ground. Issei watched her from behind, trying to figure out why she'd been acting so reserved for the past couple minutes. Meanwhile, Kishot was waiting for it. For him to ask one more question. The one question she knew he had to be just burning to know the answer to. The question that would seal her fate. Uh, hello. Her if to Kishot. A flick to the back of her head brought Kishot back to reality. Hey. I'm waiting for you to tell me what to do, doofus. Stop zoning out. Well, yes, tis one thing, but, but what? What's your deal all of a sudden? Issei cocked his head, not understanding why the blonde lowly had started to act so strangely all of a sudden. Aren't thou? Yes. Aren't thou going to ask me if ye can return to being a human? How why the hell would I? Issei exclaimed, almost recoiling. You mean you don't want to go back to being human? Kishad asked quietly, her eyes literally so wide they looked like they might bug out of her head. She totally dropped a weird form of speech she normally used, making Issei briefly wonder if it was an act to begin with. Not at all, why would I? I feel great. Issei said, flexing his new muscles. I don't know much about this whole vampire thing yet, but being a human sucks balls. Why would I ever go back? This shot couldn't even breathe. Then you're going to stay a vampire? Are you having a stroke or something? If I'm not going back to being a human, then I'm staying as a vampire. Should I check your temp? Holy shit, are you crying? This shot Acerola or Iron Heardenderblade, the legendary vampire, was indeed crying. She sniffled and wiped her eyes, trying to pretend that nothing was wrong, but try as she might, she really couldn't contain herself. Did I say something wrong? Issei asked, feeling kind of awkward while the little girl in front of him cried. No. Issei truly had absolutely no idea why she was acting this way. This shot, on the other hand, couldn't even believe it. The closely guarded secret among older vampires is that the only way to return to being human is to feed on the one who turns said human into a vampire, killing the master in the process. If Issei had asked her to return to being human, as she'd expected, he would have been asking her to die. And Kishot would have done it. For him, she would. She couldn't do it for her first servant. She wasn't ready then. But she would have been now, had he asked. But he didn't. Rather than saying would you die for me, he'd said I'll live with you. And for Kishot, who had been alone almost every day of her 600-year lifespan, that meant the world. You're seriously worrying me here. Issei cut into her thoughts with a worried pat on the head, unwittingly reaffirming his fealty to her with a simple action. She started crying harder. I'm fine. She proclaimed, wiping her eyes. Sure, sure. Let's go find that balcony or whatever you mentioned earlier. Having found the balcony, the two now sat outside, overlooking the city from the ninth or so floor of the massive school building. The balcony was rather unfinished, and large chunks of the concrete handrail were cut out. Kishot sat with her back to the wall atop the corner of said handrail, while Issei leaned against it, facing outwards. They overlooked what seemed like miles of scaffolding, the school truly having been abandoned mid-construction. Past the scaffolding were three large highways, with cars going over them at a steady pace. Normally, they'd be too far away to determine even the shape of, but Issei found he could make out even the license plate numbers with his newly enhanced vision. Being a vampire is so rad, he'd remarked under his breath. This shot wasn't entirely clear on the terminology of rad, but she hoped it meant something good. If the boy's bright smile was any indication, it did. Ignoring his glee, she began to explain his current purpose in her plans. The three who stole my arms and legs dramaturgy, episode, and guillotine cutter. They are vampire extermination specialists. Bringing himself back to paying attention, he gave her a weird look. So those are the dudes that hunted you? And wait, what's up with all these weird names? All these? Art thou implying my name is weird? Yes. This shot was on her feet in an instant, yelling down at her servant. Really? Holding his hands out to the side as if to say what do you want from me, Issei yelled back in response. Did you expect me to say no? Yes. First thou refused to say my name properly, then thou hast the audacity to dub it weird, were I not thy master, I think I'd flay thee. A thing, Kishaw plopped back down on the balcony's edge. 
Ignoring the rather blatant lack of respect for thy master, yes, those are the ones who hunted me. Well, I mean, at least you're alive, right? Mistake not my melancholy for dissatisfaction, servant. I am glad to be alive. But, tis a pain that my limbs have been taken from me. My immortality is gone, and if they were to attack me now there is no way I could fight. I would die. A solemn silence settled over Issei. He hadn't realized her situation was still that dire. So much for saving her life, he thought. Therefore. He perked up, wondering what she'd say next. If thou wilt battle these three on my behalf and bring my limbs back to me everything will be fine, will it not? Huh? In order for us to survive, I must be returned to my fully powered state. In other words, my complete form. Those four limbs they stole from me are absolutely essential for that. There was a pregnant pause as Issei considered what she'd said. So you want me, who's never gotten in a fight before ever, to beat up the three vampire hunters that almost killed you? I. You're totally nuts. I most certainly am not. How am I supposed to beat them when they beat you? Aren't you like the strongest vampire ever they'd kill me? Only if thou wert a human. Since thou art my servant and I've been weakened, thou art the most powerful vampire on the planet. Those three should be small fry. You say that, but didn't they almost kill you, even if my current self is more powerful than your weakened self, they ganked you at full power. Was a fluke. I was merely caught off guard during that battle because they cornered me altogether. If thou were to get them one at a time, twould be easy, nay, trivial to retrieve my limbs. Humming back down from the childish rage she'd flown into, she got in Issei's face. He only just now noticed, but even as a child she had the most piercing eyes he'd ever seen. In other words this should be an easy job. Late evening, April 30th, on the way back from making his first pact, Issei walked beside his bicycle. So you gotta teach me how to make stuff sometime, right? What would be the point? If ye don't plan on remaining a full vampire, twould be a useless effort. Only those of our strength can manipulate matter to the extent I can. Aw, oh, seriously? What about Ramatergy, he did the thing with the swords, and he was a shitty vampire. Aye, tis true. But what he did likely was all he could do. Creating matter and separating it from myself is a much higher level skill than simple shapeshifting, though I make it look easy. From her place inside the cart of Issei's bike, Shinobu laughed. Still in the form of a small child in a sundress, she sat cross-legged with her sun hat covering her eyes. So you really won't teach me? Tilting her head up just far enough to peek at him from under the large hat, Shinobu considered his plea. Mon, please. I'll buy you more donuts as Say teased, poking her leg. Truth be told, even if he wasn't staying a full vampire, the thought of making his own stuff instead of having to buy it was super enticing. Imagine, instead of overpriced anime figurines, just making your own. It was an otaku's dream come true. Well, I suppose that's a fair trade. Very well, I shall mentor the yet again. HMPH, what a helpless master I have. She ducked back down underneath her hat, done with that line of conversation. Without warning, a purple glow fell over the area. Ugh, this again. I'm seriously getting tired of this crap. Issei said, propping his bike against a telephone pole. Shinobu deftly flipped out of the basket, landing feet first on the concrete and melting into, quickly taking her place as Issei's shadow. Do try not to die again, my master. The pitch of Shinobu's voice within his shadow told him she had returned from the form of a child to her true state, likely preparing for battle. What a surprise, a husky feminine voice asked from behind him. Issei turned to face the source of the voice a woman walking towards him in the middle of the street, apparently the cause of the purple barrier. She was wearing a ridiculously low-cut maroon dress, and her blue hair fell all the way down to her ankles. You're not what I expected, but I'm certain you're the one I was sent to find. My name is Kalawiner, and I have orders to destroy you. Good luck. Issei yelled back, thoroughly sick of people trying to attack him for no reason. HMPH. This is truly unusual. They were supposed to have taken care of this already. From Kalawerner's back sprung two midnight black wings. Another full in Issei asked, exasperated. Just how many grunts were they gonna send at him? Why are you still alive? In an instant, Kalawerner formed and threw a spear of golden light. Issei easily dodged, diving to the side while the spear zipped past him. In the moment his left hand was outstretched to dive, Kalawerner noticed a glowing red symbol on his palm. Is that the Gremory family crest so you're the one that broke Donaseek's nose interesting? Well, the fact that you're a vampire and a devil just makes it all the more important that you're destroyed. Halwerner leapt into the air, a spear of light ready in her right hand. My master, why not take this chance to try and activate your dormant power? Huh? Thy so-called sacred gear? Was the prerequisite not simply focusing? Attempt it once more, and if thy evil eye destroys this vermin I shall simply devour her remains. Oh. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. In the time the two vampires took to converse, Kalwerner had barely cocked her arm back. Mentally, they operated so much faster than anyone else that it was entirely possible for a much longer conversation to take place before she'd even thrown the spear. 
Alright, focus. Issei began to truly focus, not distracted by something so mundane as Rhea's panties, this time. He clenched his hands and tightly shut his eyes, drawing upon all his mental strength. Focus on the part of your body you feel is strongest, Rhea's had said. Issei thought back, remembering what had happened at the beginning of this month, the most intense fight he'd ever been in. When he'd battled Kishad Acerola or Ion Hirdenderblade herself. He recalled how much strength he'd felt in his arms during that battle, each of his punches able to level a building without breaking a sweat. Oh? I am a little upset that is thy example of strength, but do as you will. Ignoring her, Issei began to focus intensely on his left arm. The strength in his vampiric limbs was immense, and if he were to truly let loose he could bring down a skyscraper without much effort. Without even realizing it, Issei began to let out a battle cry like the one he bellowed during that fight, screaming at the top of his lungs. His devil wings sprouted from his back at the same time, though he wasn't really consciously pulling them out. Focus. He roared, extending his left hand towards the sky like he was reaching to bring down the stars. All of a sudden, a bright green light began to shine from his hand. This is. Without any warning, a shockwave of power released from his arm. Alwerner had just enough time to widen her eyes in shock as the influx of power slammed her senses. The sheer windstorm generated by his release ripped her maroon dress right off her body, leaving her stark naked in the air. Issei stood mute in shock himself. Upon his left arm sat a jagged red bracer with green and gold accents and a huge emerald in the center. Is that a sacred gear? Kalwerner yelled, unable to believe her eyes. Screw this. I've got better things to do, someone else can deal with this crap. Without another word, she'd flown off, shattering her own barrier and leaving a flurry of black feathers behind. Issei was dumbfounded, staring at his arm. Is this it? The sacred gear? I suppose so. Truth be told, I didn't believe he had one at all. I wonder why thou never awakened it during our battle. Was I not pressing enough for ye? Perhaps I should have fought harder, Kaka. What do you think it does? I haven't the faintest notion. Perhaps thy master will know. Issei, dissatisfied with her vague answer, held it up to his face. Is a rather ugly thing, is it not? And somewhat familiar. Familiar. I, though I can't place from where. Perhaps tis simply my memory why not head back to that dingy club room and show thy master. Like a dog showing their owner a neat bone, Kaka. Don't make me step on you, Issei growled as he glared menacingly at his shadow. Oh? What is the saying nowadays? Don't threaten me with a good time, Issei's breath hitched and he nearly choked. Hearing that sultry voice from the fully restored Kishot, who was without contest the most beautiful woman alive, was enough to make his heart skip a beat and his lower head have ideas. Curb thy perversity. As flattering as thy excitement is, do not presume for a moment I shall simply forget thou stripping that woman right in front of me, ye dog. That was so not my fault. How the hell was I supposed to know this thing strips chicks? Wait, do you think that's what the power is? Issei suddenly began to foam at the mouth, inspecting the bracer with a newfound excitement. On behalf of all women, I sincerely hope not. Congratulations, you found it. Rias was in a rather businesslike pose, with her elbows propped up on her desk and her hands folded underneath her chin. She spoke with reservation, but a hint of excitement was clear. Issei was back in the orc club room, surrounded by his fellow devils. Shinobu remained in his shadow, mostly due to her master's earlier request to stop antagonizing Rias. Now that you've awakened it, dismissing the gear should be as simple as thinking it. But the red flash, the bracer on Issei's arm disappeared. Oh thank goodness. I was worried that thing was just gonna stay put, Issei said sheepishly. I'm so proud of you, Issei. Akeno announced from beside him, a genuine smile on her face. Still not used to her attention, the poor boy could only shyly grin and rub the back of his head. You are? Thanks Issei replied, not really knowing how to properly accept the praise. This does put me in a bit of a strange position, Ria's interjected, returning to the subject. The remaining fallen angels now know that not only are you a vampire and a devil, but you do indeed have a sacred gear. Things are sure to get more complicated. Oh my bad, Issei apologized, looking down at the ground. He didn't really mean to cause trouble, and it made him feel bad. I know you ran into the fallen as an accident, but please don't get carried away now that you've unlocked your sacred gear and try to fight them on your own. I realize you and Miss Shinobu could easily beat them, but it would be disrespectful to the rest of us. The way she reprimanded him was reminiscent of a scolding teacher, and it made him a little guilty, even though he hadn't done a whole lot. Sighing, Issei hung his head. I understand, he said solemnly. Thank you. I'm a little tired now, so I'm gonna head home. A moment later, the door closed behind Issei as he headed back to his house. Exaggeration much? Akeno said accusingly once he was completely gone. Rias looked to her queen, who looked back at her with a worried look. He's still new, why do you have to scare him? I'm not trying to scare him, Rias replied indignantly, I just don't want him to overestimate himself. Plus, she added, absentmindedly biting at her fingernail, I will not let the fallen take my new favorite servant. 
The next morning, May 1st, ugh. Issei groaned and picked his head up out of his pillow that is to say, pillows, as he was once again being used as a hug doll by a certain sleeping vampiress and had his head firmly planted in her chest. Again? He thought, having assumed Shinobu sleeping in his bed had been a one-time thing. Apparently it wasn't, though this time she wasn't naked. Although she may as well have been. But Shinobu was wearing barely even classified as clothes in the modern sense of the word. She had on a disastrously low-cut black nightgown, and while it wasn't see-through, it was plain for the poor boy to tell that she had absolutely nothing on under it. What the hell, Shinobu, shh. The say sentence was cut off as she rolled over, smothering him between her and the bed. His blush turned atomic as she nuzzled the crook of his neck with her cheek, whispering nonsense in her sleep. His poor heart felt like it was about to beat out of his chest, and he was positive if he didn't have vampiric healing his brain would have already dripped out through his nose. It wasn't just her chest or face pressed against him, either. Her entire body was pushing down like she was trying to wear him. Her legs were wrapped restrictively around his knees, and her arms had an iron grip around his chest. Her fully powered form was undoubtedly the physically strongest thing on earth, and her crushing grip reflected that. Resigning himself to not getting out of her vice, Issei's senses kicked into overdrive, trying to take in every possible detail of her while he had the chance. Why does she smell so sweet? And why is she so warm? Issei felt himself began to lose a bit of self-control. She was just so enticing. Dear God, if this is a dream, please let me never wake up. Amen. As Issei sent the silent prayer, he felt a sharp pain throb in his head, but hardly enough to distract him from the situation. MMM. Suddenly, Shinobu moaned in her sleep and turned over once more. This time, however, was rather violent. Unfortunately for both of them, they ended up on the floor, Shinobu's strength rolling them off the bed entirely. Issei landed on his hands and knees on top of her, while she was flat on her back looking up at him. Now, here's the problem with that. I, your humble narrator, may have fibbed. Issei did in fact land on his knees, but he only landed on one hand. The other, however, ended up underneath Shinobu's nightgown and firmly wrapped around her left breast. His brain broke. The softness was unreal. It was too much for his vampire senses to handle. Holy shit. This is a titty. No, no, this is the titty. He jumped for joy in his mind, having truly achieved the pinnacle of second base on planet Earth. But then, he had to swallow hard. There was a choice to be made. He had touched titty, yes. But had he touched nip, ahem. The same nearly jumped out of his skin as the vampire he was currently definitely not molesting, cleared her throat. He slowly turned his gaze upward to her face, not moving a muscle. The face he saw staring back was not at all what he expected. Rather than a pissed-off vampire, he saw Shinobu, with a blush not unlike that of a teenage girl, refusing to meet his gaze and staring off to the side of the room. She was nervously biting her bottom lip and appeared to be trembling just a bit. Be gentle, Millard tis my first time. She whispered, not looking. Issei blacked out. Thou art a cretin. I'm sorry. The barbarian. I'm sorry. The damnable criminal. Were we in my time, thou would be thrown in a dungeon to rot. Issei groaned in anguish. He was apologizing to Shinobu, who walked beside him with her umbrella out. She was in the form of a teenager his age, wearing a purple hoodie and black skirt with black leggings to match. Her hood was up, and her blonde hair spilled down out of it in a ponytail that reached down to her midriff. An important distinction to make is that Shinobu was under the umbrella. Issei was about four feet behind her, sweltering under the sun. As per Rhea's suggestion, they were both at the level of a half-vampire, which was enough to not burn in sunlight but still be pretty uncomfortable. Shinobu, able to easily bypass this weakness, had her umbrella out over her head. Issei, who still had not been taught to create anything except his clothes, was unable to share in such luxury. Of course, he was by no means allowed in her umbrella because he couldn't be trusted to keep his hands away from where they shouldn't be. Look, I said I'm sorry. And hey, you're the one that rolled us off the damn bed. This is at least 75% your fault. And what was with that be gentle bit? It was almost like you wanted. Snapping around to face him, Shinobu glared the poor boy down with such intensity that he physically couldn't finish the sentence. Her golden slit pupil eyes spoke of hell on earth if he even for a second implied something so uncouth. I mean I'm sorry he said instead, hanging his head. HMPH. Pathetic. Shinobu turned back around, walking forward with a renewed speed, while Issei struggled to keep up. Thou art so much a coward that ye had to attack me in my sleep, rather than simply making a move, and ye couldn't even go all the way. I'm sorry, what was that? Issei asked, having heard every word with his vampiric hearing. Silence. She yelled, walking even faster. Issei huffed in resignation, not at all understanding her deal. So, she wasn't mad at him for accidentally groping her, she was mad because that's all he did. Why are girls so complicated? I can still hear thy thoughts, mongrel. Get out of my head, damn it. It bothered Issei to no end that their vampiric link shared everything. 
He could feel what she was feeling, sure, but that also meant she could feel what he was feeling. And hear what he was thinking. Issei wasn't experienced enough to read anyone's mind, whether it was through their link or with his powers, but Shinobu absolutely was, and if she focused she could most certainly read his mind. And Akinda ticked him off. He couldn't even think bad thoughts in peace. Uchi. Somewhere behind them, a small feminine voice cried out in pain. He turned around to find the source, and, much to his glee, was met with the sight of white panties. Some girl had fallen over, and her rear was sticking straight up in the air for him to see. She wore a strange black nun's outfit with a white veil covering most of her head, and around her were scattered articles of clothing and an open suitcase. The growl from behind him reminded Issei who he'd been walking with in the first place, and he gulped in fear at the thought of what Shinobu would do if he ogled someone else right in front of her again. I must have fallen down again I'm such a klutz. The girl sat up, holding her head with one hand. Holy shit hot chick. She was seriously gorgeous, with long blonde hair and bright green eyes, and the most innocent look Issei had ever seen. She only just noticed him and looked like a deer caught in headlights. Hey there, are you alright? Issei asked, coming to his senses and stepping forward to help her. He extended a hand, which she gratefully accepted. Oh, yeah, I'm okay, really she insisted, pulling herself off the ground with his hand. As she stood up, a gust of wind blew the veil off her head, revealing her face entirely. Issei couldn't help but stare. She was just so cute. Shinobu was gorgeous, without a doubt the most beautiful woman alive, but this girl was the kind of adorable that could drive men insane. But she said awkwardly, and Issei only then realized he'd been holding her hand the entire time. Oh. Sorry. He said, jumping backwards. Then he realized her veil is still on the ground and picked it up for her before the wind blew it away. Oh, thank you, you're too kind. Oh please, it was nothing. I wasn't aware thou spoke Italian, my master, Shinobu said in Japanese, finally entering the conversation. She didn't even acknowledge the blonde girl, simply standing beside Issei and narrowing her eyes at him from underneath the umbrella. Italian? Issei asked her, furrowing his brow. Oh, hello there, the girl said, bowing her head to Shinobu. Returning her attention to Issei, she nervously put her fingertips together and looked down at the ground. Um, I hate to ask this, but you're the only one I've met here who speaks Italian, I'm a little lost, could you help me out a bit? But Issei glanced at Shinobu, wondering what in the world they both were talking about. She simply shrugged, waving her free hand in a do-what-you-want sort of motion. Feeling like somehow he'd regret it later, Issei turned back towards the blonde girl. Sure, where did you need to go? End of the here. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. I.